Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Williamson County in Illinois, Tim Bullock and Barbara Smith were parked in a car when a 10-foot-tall hairy humanoid threw dirt through the window at them. This, of course, scared them. The creature had a hairy head the size of a steering wheel and had suddenly emerged from the bushes. A large depression was found in the area the next day. It was not a bear. This was near a wooded bottomland swamp just three miles from the Big Muddy River. The police were notified. Hairy humanoids had been seen here before. In the meantime, there had been sightings of gigantic cats and a giant man-bird. On to the next one. In Cook County in Illinois, a friend of mine and I were trying to find a place that two girls we met had invited us to for the night somewhere east of Carpentersville. From looking at the maps, from today, it would seem like we were lost in what is now Barrington Hills or somewhere around there. Lots of woods and nothing else. When we realized we were lost, we took the next road to the left just to turn around and go back towards Carpentersville. As we came to a stop just off the road, before we started to back up onto the main road, a creature about as tall as the Ford van we were in, started to cross the side road from our left to right about 15 to 20 feet in front of the van. It had a long stride, stood upright, was covered with dark brownish to black straight hair about 6 to maybe 10 inches long in some spots. It was swinging its arms that looked like they were too long for its torso. Its head was turned to its right, and it was looking almost straight at us as it crossed, and as we were backing up to get out of there. Its face was also covered with the same type of hair, but shorter and not so much around the eyes, nose, and mouth. It had no muzzle or snout like a chimp would have, just a flatter face. As we were backing onto the main road, I was looking to my right and as we started to pull away, I thought I saw it coming back towards the van, like it had changed direction, and it was going to chase the van. This scared me even more than I already was, and my friend was no different. Really scared. It looked so powerful, like it could have torn the doors off with no trouble whatsoever. We just kind of looked at each other for a few seconds as we drove out of there, saying over and over, what was that? What was that? Needless to say, no one believed us, and I couldn't blame them either. Because if someone had come and told me that same story as we told, I wouldn't have believed them either. Except for one thing. I was there, and I know what I saw, not just what it was that I saw. The only other witness was my friend who was driving. Only since then, I have read that other sightings have been made in other areas near there or thereabouts. It was around 9 to 9.30 p.m. The weather was clear and cool, and the headlights were bright. It was dark, but it looked like big pines and hardwood forest to me all around, nothing else. The boonies is what we called it back then. I was about 18 years old then. On to the next one. In Fulton County in Illinois, I was at a creek where I hung out almost every summer with my brothers and friends. It was probably sometime in July. There was a huge tree about 300 feet from a bridge that went across the creek. Myself and two younger brothers were on this bridge on our bikes. I saw something big in that tree 300 feet away, and I kept an eye on it. 
Then I saw something the same size as a full-grown chimp, about four feet tall, swinging from limb to limb and just playing in the tree. I told my brothers, look at that huge monkey. We sat and watched it for five incredulous minutes. I couldn't believe my eyes. All of a sudden, I had this incredible, overwhelming sense of terror. I didn't see anything threatening. I just felt terrified. I told my brothers, we have to go right now. And I made them follow me. And on the way up, my middle brother said, go fast. There's a man chasing me. He was in the rear of us. We rode as fast as we could about half a mile home. And he said it was a strange, hairy man chasing us. I think that it was a Bigfoot protecting its young in the tree. It just chased us off. I didn't go back to that creek the rest of the summer. It scared me to death. I never went back there that summer. I did go back the next year, but we had no more sightings or anything unusual. There were three witnesses, myself and my two younger brothers. I don't think they remember it. They were 10 and 9 at the time. I heard of some rumors of sightings at Norris Creek and Canton Lake, with this creek connected to both, and it was in the middle of it. It was in the late afternoon. The weather was clear. Very good. Excellent vision on a clear day. There was a good-sized creek back then that lead to Canton Lake. Woodsy, nice creek. Could fish in it for small bluegill, catfish. It might be dried up now. On to the next one. To celebrate our engagement, Ryan, my fiancé, took me on a coastal excursion to a series of Pacific Northwest locations that were sentimental for him. Later in the trip, he brought me to Copalis Beach. The place was already known for being relatively hidden from most people, but we visited on a frigid winter day so we were the only ones around. As soon as we got out of the car, I felt like we were the only ones for miles. Ryan led me through a few pine trees, which we had to push through. We finally made it to a cliff, where he wanted us to watch the sunset, but the clouds were a little too thick. Shortly after we got there and sat down, Ryan was the first to hear something that he thought sounded odd. It was a little windy, making it hard to hear anything, but the occasional murmur. It sounded like a couple of people were conversing somewhere beneath the cliff, but there was something very peculiar about the voices. I suppose one might say they sounded kind of ghostly. Also, it seemed as though they spoke a language familiar to neither of us. Ryan already thought it was strange for anyone to be there, let alone speak an unidentifiable language. That aspect probably stood out to him more than it would to other people because he was fluent in five languages, so he was more skilled than most at picking up on that kind of thing for whatever reason. I wasn't nearly as curious as Ryan was about these voices, and I continued to sit while he stood and walked to the edge to see if he could see anything. Don't get too close, I said, nervous that he would lose his footing. I could tell that something had caught his eye because his gaze was glued to the same spot, and it was like he hadn't even heard me. What are those? murmured Ryan. What are you talking about? I replied, caught off guard by the word what and those. At the time, I blamed it on the interference of the wind, but I noticed I could no longer hear the strange dialogue. As I got up and approached my fiancé, he put up a hand, warning me to stay back. I assumed he merely didn't want me getting closer to the cliff, but then a weird, animalistic noise suggested otherwise. It was unlike anything I'd ever heard before but I suppose I'd say it was like a combination of a roar and a grunt, but it trailed off in this extraordinary echo. While I continued to inch my way toward the cliff, I just knew I was about to see something rare. 
I had no idea how rare, but I knew we were in a unique place at a unique time. It was as if my insides froze the very second that I laid eyes on the group of four. They weren't humans nor apes, at least not any that I knew to exist. These things appeared to be something else entirely, though they were pretty far beneath us. I could see there was something so eerie about their faces. They had the strangest facial expressions, making it clear that these creatures were an unpredictable bunch, and although they were a reasonable distance below, I could tell these beings were some of the most powerful life forms on Earth. They were huge. I don't think I even got five seconds to look at these things before Ryan ripped me away from the edge. As I fell to the ground, I watched the large stone hurtling upward with impressive velocity. I'm not sure it would have hit either of us had my fiancé not moved me, but it would have at least come extremely close. Ryan helped me up, and we ran through the woods back toward the car. Although I didn't look back, I heard something crash in the woods behind us, which prompted us to pick up the pace and scrape our faces on unforeseen branches. I suspected it was the sound of another large stone landing upon the soil. If either of those rocks had hit my head, I don't think there's any way I could have survived. Everything felt so surreal. We made our way back onto the road. Since it was clear we had escaped, the fear converted to a sense of thrill. Ryan was the first to suggest that we had seen a group of Bigfoot. That notion hadn't even crossed my mind until he mentioned it. Ryan and I are still together, and we embrace every piece of intellectual Bigfoot content that we can find. It's still so crazy to me that these things are real. I don't think that feeling will ever go away. On to the next one. Jack Harris was driving on the only road leading into the Lake Worth Nature Center when he spotted a Bigfoot crossing the road in front of him. The man-beast ran up and down a bluff and was soon being watched by 30 to 40 people who had come to the area to see it after the Fort Worth Star-Telegram headlined a story entitled Fishy Man Terrifies Couple Parked at Lake Worth. Within a short time, sheriff's officers were also there and observed the same creature. When it appeared that the onlookers were getting too close to the creature, it fired a spare tire complete with the rim at them, and they jumped back into their cars. The seven-foot-tall hairy humanoid weighed 300 pounds, walked on two feet, and had whitish gray hair. It also made a pitiful cry like something was hurting it. It was seen to throw the tire and rim more than 500 feet. The creature was high up on a bluff and apparently annoyed by the carloads of witnesses who were looking at it. This was in Lake Worth, Tarrant County in Texas. On to the next one. A 14-year-old boy was in an area only accessible by water on the Brazos River near Mineral Wells in Palo Pinto County in Texas. He was one of a party of 20 campers and two counselors on a three-day, two-night canoe and camping trip down the Brazos River. They put in just below the dam at Possum Kingdom Lake. As they were setting up camp, some of the campers spotted some type of unknown animal peering down at them from atop a 30-foot cliff. No one thought much about it. The next morning, the boy's canoe and tent buddy told him that he had seen the animal. The first boy knew a way to get up the cliff face, and they were on top in no time, and could hear something running off through the woods. They immediately gave chase, and the first boy was in the lead. There were some large boulders lying around, and he ran around one of the larger ones. But as he ran around it, 
he ran smack into another large tree which knocked him back flat on his rump. He was crumpled at the base of the tree and dazed. When his eyes focused again, he noticed that the tree had hair. He looked up, the creature screamed, and the boy literally peed in his pants. The friend screamed, it screamed, the boy screamed. It screamed again, and all of this in quick and distorted time. The boys were in a blind panic and ran right off the edge of the cliff. The boys said that they had run into a giant gorilla. Everybody thought that they were crazy and had made it all up. When the boys ran into it, he only saw from the waist down, and it was covered in dark, almost black hair. On to the next one. On Greer Island in Lake Worth in Tarrant County in Texas, Several witnesses saw a swimming gorilla-like creature that was seen in the lake. Parties of searchers, many carrying guns, descended onto the lake area around Lake Worth, usually at night, and many stated that the man-beast resembled a big white ape. Traps were also found that were 16 inches long and 8 inches wide at the toes. On one occasion, Searchers fired on the beast and insisted that they followed a trail of blood and tracked to the edge of the water. On another occasion, three men insisted that the creature leapt into and jumped off only after the car collided with a tree. Other witnesses stated that they heard the beast and also smelled it as it was associated with a foul odor. On to the next one. Near the South Sulphur River, near Commerce in White Hunt County in Texas, Jerry Matlock, Kenneth Wilson, and others saw an eight-foot-tall, hairy, brown-haired Bigfoot with wide shoulders that suddenly came fast over a levee toward their car at night. The men drove away while unsuccessfully trying to fire a gun at the creature. On to the next one. At Lake Worth in Tarrant County in Texas, at 2 a.m., Charles Bunchnan was sleeping in the back of his pickup truck when he suddenly awoke to see a tall, hairy humanoid towering over him. The man be seemed to be a cross between a human and a gorilla. The creature jerked Charles to the ground, who was still in his sleeping bag and gagged from the stench of the beast. Charles, in his desperation, grabbed a bag of leftover chicken and shoved it into the creature's face. The creature grabbed the bag from him, and with its long arms, it took the sack into its mouth and made some guttural noises and then loped off through the trees, went into the water, and swam toward Greer Island with powerful stroke. On to the next one. At Lake Somerville in Burleson County in Texas, I observed a strange howling scream, a foul stench shortly after moonset, the lake wind had died down and the night was calm. Our dogs started getting nervous and ran whimpering under the car. A few minutes later, the air filled with the most god-awful stench like that of rotten meat, only mustier. I remember my mother saying, what the heck is that smell? And my brother sat up in his cot. When he sat up is when all of us heard the scream. My family and myself have spent many hours in the Texas woodlands, and I know most of the sounds native animals make. I have never heard anything like that in my life. Even thinking about it now, some 24 years later, it still makes me shiver and break out in goosebumps. As I have stated, I know most of the animal sounds in the state. I can tell you that it was not a bobcat, panther, cougar, Havelina, Screech Owl, or anything else I can think of. I've only heard one thing that even comes close, 
and that the audio tape of Sasquatch. And, as I said, it was close. The scream started out as a low, growling sound that ended in a shrill scream. It was loud. I mean, incredibly loud. I shot one round from my gun into the air, and whatever it was, went away, or so he thought. By now, we had built a roaring fire, but this did not stop it. It came back eight times before daybreak. It was not afraid of us, nor the fire. Only the sound of the gunfire would drive it off. All shots were fired in the air because, quite frankly, we could not find a target to shoot at. As soon as it got light enough, we went looking for tracks, a path through the grass, something, anything. There were plenty of tracks from raccoons, possums, the dog, ourselves, mice and birds, but nothing unusual. The only thing we found was a small stand of saplings with their tops broken at about five and a half feet above ground, about 200 yards away east of our camp. I mention this because these saplings had that same horrible stench, only not nearly as strong. The second night we were there, the full moon had set about 3 a.m. Earlier that night, I had moved our garbage can up the road after dinner to keep the raccoons from keeping us up all night. It was midsummer, hot, and very dry. We had our lean-to pitched between two live oak trees in a tall grass field that sloped down to the lake shore. There had not been any rain in that area for some time, so that most of the grass had dried out. Dry grass cuts down on ticks and other insects. There was about an eighth inch of dust over the hard tack in the exposed area. There was also a small pond about 40 yards down the slope between our campsite and the lake shore. This, I believe, had once been a stock tank. The open end of the lean-to was facing the lake shore so as to get the breeze from the lake. The other end faced a dirt road that was about 300 yards upgrade. On to the next one. Kathiana Eagle was with her family when they took her 1999 quad cap pickup hunting near St. Anthony, Idaho one day. They shot three elk and brought them home. They spent the next few hours and days gutting them out and hanging them to bleed. They had mostly cleaned the pickup, but there was still some blood in the back of the truck they hadn't washed out yet. The next day, they were above Bannock Creek with the same truck. They were gone all day, coming home late at night with three dogs sitting in the back seat. All of a sudden, the truck started losing power and the RPMs went way up. About that time, Eagle felt something hit the back of the truck. The dogs jumped over the seat onto the floor of the passenger side of the truck, she said. It was pitch black outside and I couldn't see him, but I knew he, the Bigfoot, was there. He stayed there about a quarter to a half a mile until we hit the Arban Valley Road, and then I felt him jump out of the back. Immediately, the RPMs went back down and the dogs relaxed. I was freaking out. It was scary, Eagle said. I flew down the road to Bannock Creek. When I stopped later, we took a good look at the back of the truck. She and her husband found a clear hand and footprint in the truck and could see where the Bigfoot had licked the blood out of the grooves in the truck bed. I took pictures of it all, but the pictures never developed, she said. That seems to happen with pictures of the Bigfoot. Eagle's job involved delivering newspapers in the middle of the night to drop locations from where they will be delivered to customers the following day. On one particular day, she was coming home as the sun was coming up. She clearly saw a Bigfoot sitting about a hundred feet off the road. He had his foot crossed over his other leg, and he was picking something out of his foot. 
I can still see it in my mind's eye as he spread his toes apart, she said. He was dark brown with a reddish tinge and he had this head tilted at an angle so I couldn't see his face. He was just pulling something out of his foot like we might do when we are walking around barefoot. She often sees the Bigfoot on the way home in the early morning light. Three different times she has seen him on Siphon Road in the dip just before it meets up with the freeway. The last time I saw him there, he was standing along the side of the road, she said. There was a bush there, and he was apparently trying to blend in. I got a good look at him as he stepped over the guardrail heading north. It was just a short glimpse, but he looked pretty beat up. On to the next one. Danielle Danny Eldridge grew up on the Shoshone Bannock Indian Reservation, where they moved around a lot. About the time she was in the third grade, her family moved to a home on Gay Main Road near Mount Putnam. I was sitting outside on the front porch with the rest of the kids when I heard what sounded like a huge pack of dogs fighting, she said. It sounded awful. Then we heard a screaming yell like a dog was being ripped in half. The sound echoed off the hillside. It was enough to make a huge impression on her. She never forgot what she heard. Years later, she was once again living on the reservation when she had another odd experience. It was late at night, and her children were all in bed when she happened to glance out the back window where there was a big bush in her yard. I realized there was something wrong with what I was seeing. Then I recognized there was something there that shouldn't have been there. It looked like a big bush, except I don't have a bush in my yard, she said. Then it stood up. It was huge, black, and very fast. She immediately decided it would be a good idea to shut the window and the blind. She was attempting to do that when the Bigfoot began to run around her trailer. It sounded like a huge Clydesdale horse thundering around the trailer, she said. It was pounding on all the sides of the trailer. Standing up, it was almost taller than the trailer. I can't even begin to express how terrified I was. It moved so fast that she thought it must have some type of mystical power. By then, her children were up and in the living room when she joined them and the family dog a pit bull. He was shaking, she said. A short time later, the Bigfoot left, and she did too, packing some bags and taking her children with what they could grab quickly. She went somewhere she thought might be safer. That week, she moved away from that house. I wasn't about to go back to that house, she said. I figured the Bigfoot could have it if he wanted it. On to the next one. Adrian Jody Edmo took his wife to camp near Mount Putnam a few years ago and had what some would think was an enviable experience. Edmo stayed near a family of Bigfoot. There was an older male and a female and three juveniles. And he was able to see them and watch them for half an hour at a time. We were up by Mount Putnam near Five Point for nearly three months in the fall, said Edmo. We ran into an entire Bigfoot family. We learned to tell them apart and which one was which when we recognized their footprints. There was one Bigfoot making a 22-inch footprint, another which made an 18-inch footprint, while a smaller one possessed an 8-inch footprint. Two other sets of footprints were jumbled together the Edmo family saw the Bigfoot family regularly and would frequently interact with them and leave them gifts. We would leave them deer and elk meat and occasionally potatoes, fish, or wild berries, Edmo said. We would also play music for them. He said the Bigfoot were all brown and black like an elk, but with a silvery sheen to their hair, especially when it was wet. It was rather pretty. 
Edmo called the biggest one old man, as he was obviously older than the others, and one day the old man Bigfoot came all the way up to where Edmo had parked his pickup near their camp. Edmo said his family would go up and camp in the same area each time they went to the mountains. They would usually stay until they became uncomfortable, ran out of supplies, or felt the need to leave. Then they would move their camp downhill. The Bigfoot would follow us down the hill, he said. They startled the horses, but they would come in and take the meat and corn I would leave for them. He said when his grandsons and nephew would come with him to hunt, they would always leave the Bigfoot, the heart, liver, and kidneys of their kill. While this experience seems fanciful, Edmo said the Bigfoot had been up there as long as he has been going up there, all of his 72 years. They've been there since I was a child. They don't scare me. I would ride all of the old horse trails all over, Edmo said. They'd come by us at our feedlot on the reservation in the spring and the fall as they traveled back to Mount Putnam across the reservation. A lot of people see them, but we don't bother them, while the Bigfoot he has seen usually have brown eyes. The ones with red eyes can't be trusted. They are more aggressive, he says. They eat more meat than the others. The peaceful ones usually have brown eyes. Some of them are not as hairy as others. A couple of them have longer claws on their feet. They are a little scary, he said. Edmo said he has always said prayers to them as the Bigfoot have their own medicine. He has also seen the Bigfoot disappear right in front of people. We just go about our business, he said. The Bigfoot often comes down to the sundown ceremony and people will often see them afterward. They are good, strong medicine, he said. They have trails all over the bottom where we call the government meadow. Edmo also related a story of the time when a Bigfoot was killed near Mount Putnam back when he was a kid. It was over 40 years ago. Some children were fooling around and coming down Ross Fork Road too fast when they hit a baby Bigfoot, he said. They told the tribal fish and game who went to check it out. They found the body and wrapped it in a blanket. Later, they dug a hole near where it was hit and buried it. The medicine man said a lot of prayers. Edmo said that the grave is down near the bottom of the valley by Mount Putnam. No one bothers it as they respect the Bigfoot too much. On to the next one. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Royal Tyrell Museum in Drumheller, Alberta, but it's one of Canada's finest museums and a big tourist attraction. Lots of families make it a destination for their vacation. Kids love the place, as do most adults. It's basically a dinosaur museum, although that's a little misleading, as it also has invertebrate fossils from famous Burgess Shale in Yoho National Park as well as fossils from the Pleistocene, so its exhibits span a long time, most of the Earth's prehistory. But even though this museum has world-class fossils, such as the coal-black bones of the T-Rex called Black Beauty, it's also world-class in the way the fossils are displayed. At times, it's almost like being in an art museum the way everything's perfectly lit and arranged. Anyway, not to get too sidetracked on the museum, as you can find out more about it on the internet, but just to mention it as being the backdrop to my family's annual vacation. Lots of Canadians visit the Rockies or go to Vancouver for vacations, but my family always went to Drumheller and the museum. And it's also home to some of the worst hordes of mosquitoes I've ever seen. But that's another story. We always spent two weeks each summer there helping as volunteers. 
My dad was a banker, and this is how he wanted to spend his vacation. Plus, he thought it would be good for us three kids. My mom enjoyed it too. Plus, she knew my dad wanted to be a paleontologist, so she did it for him. It was the happiest time of our family life, and I'll always treasure the memories. Except one, and I don't think treasure is the right word. Try to forget is more like it. We usually did stuff at the museum, primarily in the bone lab. We'd been trained in removing fossils from their rock matrices, and it was painstaking and slow work. So the museum was always happy to have trained volunteers. Of course, this could get monotonous, so we would break it up with helping set up displays and things like that. We all learned so much. And it was fascinating. We had a small camp trailer and would stay at a nearby RV park. I especially liked the Burgess Shale exhibit, as it was like walking through the ocean when the strangest creatures live, like the Halogenica and Pikia. I always gravitated to that exhibit, weird as it was. Well, one year, my dad decided we needed to try something different something outdoors and more physical. So he arranged for us to park our trailer at a site the museum was excavating out in the Badlands near Drumheller in Horseshoe Canyon. We were very excited at the opportunity to actually help dig up bones like the ones we'd been working on at the museum. We felt like little Indiana Joneses. Yes, my parents were happily raising three little nerds even though none of us actually became paleontologists. My brother's an insurance adjuster, and my sister's a nurse, and I'm in administration for the Canadian Provincial Park. So, that summer, we hauled our trailer out to the dig site and set up camp. There were several paleontologists there, a couple from various universities and one from the museum. Plus, a dozen or so students who were getting college credit for digging. This was going to be a special vacation. I could just feel it in my bones. Another thing that made it special was that we were able to bring our dog, Dippy, when usually we had to leave him with a dog sitter. Dippy was an unusual dog. Nobody could figure out what breed he was, and I think it's because he was a bunch of breeds mixed together a mutt. Dippy was short for Diplodocus, a big dinosaur with a long neck and a long tail that fed on leaves. Dippy had a long neck and tail, and thus his name, though he didn't eat leaves. Being on a bone dig is actually mostly a lot of hard work and isn't a bit glamorous, though we found out. But the thought of maybe discovering a new species or something significant made it exciting in its own way. In spite of mostly just digging in the ground, then extracting whatever you found and wrapping it for transportation to the museum. And the mosquitoes kept us from slowing down too much. If you stopped, they would eat you alive. Even though we all wore mosquito nets and long sleeved shirts and pants, they didn't bother Dippy, fortunately probably because of his long hair. We were working on the colorful badland eroded out by the Red Deer River, different layers of pinks and whites and tan, very pretty, down in a small valley. We'd been there about a week and a half when everyone left to go into town for some kind of visiting display. It was a two-day grand opening for some new dinosaur from China, and the people who had found it would be there to talk about it. We kids were given the choice of going or staying, and partly because of Dippy and not being sure what to do with him while in a motel, we decided to stay. Besides, having a dino dig all to ourselves was a big deal to us. We would be in charge for one, though in charge of what, I don't know, each other maybe, though none of us were very good at following orders, 
unless it was from our parents, and we had strict orders to stay at camp, though I had no idea where our parents thought we might go with no transportation. So everyone left, and there we were, at our dino bone camp, just the three of us and Dippy. It felt very cool, and we pretended we were famous paleontologists out on a dig in the wilds of Argentina, home to many major fossil finds. This was fun for a while. Then we got bored with it and went back to work. We did take more breaks than usual, but we generally didn't have much to do except dig. So we dug. Everyone else had left early that morning, and by mid-afternoon, the novelty had worn off. Connie, my sister, was kind of over on one side of the dig by herself and Joey and I were both digging on a nearby slope. I was engrossed in trying to chip a small bone out of a rock when I saw a shadow above me. Looking up, I could see Connie standing on the slope above me. She looked at me, then sat down by me and whispered, Tommy, somebody's watching us. How can you tell? I casually looked around but saw nothing. Can't you feel it? She asked. I sat there for a while, silent, but felt nothing. Where are they? I asked. I don't know. Now Joey had joined us. Something feels creepy all of a sudden, he said. That's because Connie's making you feel that way, I replied. No, I felt it before she came over. It's like something's watching us. It made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Dippy isn't worried. And he's a good guard dog, I said, pointing to where he was curled up in the dirt, sleeping. I'm going to work over here by you guys, Connie said. We all got back to work when suddenly I felt it. We were definitely being watched. How could I tell? I can't explain it. It was just a feeling, some kind of intuition. Maybe a sixth sense left over when we humans were more wild and had to watch out for predators. Okay, we were pretty scared, but being budding scientists, we wanted some kind of evidence. It wasn't just in our head. We all three stood there in silence, casually looking around, but trying not to be real obvious about it. If there was someone spying on us, we wanted to be cool and not let them know as we figured this would somehow give us an advantage. Finally, when we saw nothing, and yet still felt weird, like we were still being watched, I whispered, get to the trailer, but don't run or act scared. As the oldest, I was in charge any time our parents left us, and my brother and sister were used to listening to me. They knew mom and dad would always stand behind me, if there was any question about our behavior, as I had a good credibility rating. So off we shuffled to the trailer, afraid to look behind us, but also wanting to look and see if we were being followed. My brother was the last inside, behind Dippy, and he almost slammed the door. He was so nervous. I reached over and locked it behind him. Keep in mind, this was just a small travel trailer, the kind you see parked behind people's garages with weeds growing all around the wheels. Nothing special or expensive, kind of just a tin can. It certainly wouldn't have provided us much safety, as it would have been pretty easy to break into. We pulled the curtains closed and sat there around the little dinette, saying nothing. It was only mid-afternoon, and our parents and the dig crew wouldn't be back until sometime the next day. We had a long time to ponder life on our own in the back country of Horseshoe Canyon. Finally, Connie whispered, I know there's something malevolent out there. You don't have the hair on your neck stand up for no reason. Yeah, Joey chimed in, and we all three felt it. Look, I said, it seems to me that about the only dangerous thing out there other than the gigantic mosquitoes, would be bone thieves. You suppose someone knew everyone was leaving, 
and is now planning on stealing the bones we've been working on. How they would know that is beyond me, Connie said, since they're still in the rock. It would take a gorilla to carry off even the little bit of stuff we've loosened up. Maybe the bone thieves aren't aware of that and are coming in to see what they can steal. Maybe they weren't planning on us staying behind, Joey said. We could be in a very dangerous situation, I said, sounding all authoritative when I was really feeling like a chicken. I think we should just stay inside until everyone comes back. That's not going to work, Connie said. First of all, what if we need to use the bathroom? The porta potty is clear on the other side of the dig. Are we just going to sit in here all night, scared to death in the dark, wondering what's out there? I vote we go right back out and let whoever it is know there's nothing here for them. How would you do that? asked Joey. We could just yell at them. Hey, there's nothing here. No bones worth taking. Then get back to work. You're always the pragmatic one, I replied wryly. Well, this went on for a while, the three of us arguing, like we always did, until Connie finally made us feel like cowards and we decided to take action. We would climb a small hill back behind the trailer where we could see out. If there was someone parked down the road trying to hide, we could see them, as well as all around the dig site. Where we'd been digging was kind of in a bowl, and climbing up out of it would either reveal who was out there or reassure us that our imaginations were indeed getting the best of us. This was great, except for the execution was kind of hard, as we were all still scared stiff, but we finally opened the door and took off up the hill. We basically ran up it and were winded by the time we got to the top, where we got down on our stomachs behind some bushes and peered down at the dig site below. I still laugh when I think about that. Anyone watching us could easily see us run up there and hide. We crouched down there for some time and saw nothing. I was about ready to write it off to our overactive imagination when I thought I saw something move back behind a big rock near the dig and now Dippy, who had been crouched down with us as well as a dog can crouch, began growling. Someone's hiding over there, I said quietly, pointing to the rock. We crouched down even lower and watched. Before long, a head poked out from above the rock. It took a minute for me to register what I was seeing. Whoever it was, they were very tall to be able to look out over that rock. Joey said what I was thinking. They must be really tall to see over the rock. It's big. We watched in silence as whoever it was now stepped out from behind the rock. They either hadn't seen us run up the hill or didn't care if we saw them. I put my hand around Dippy's muzzle to keep him quiet. And as they now became totally visible to us, no one said a word. We all lay there in shock at what we were seeing. Finally, Connie said, Wow, that's a good costume. Joey replied, A good way to not be recognized when out thieving. I said, I don't think it's a costume, guys. If you watch its legs, you can see the muscles rippling. I was worried about that, Joey said nervously. What is it? Connie asked, and I could tell she was trying not to cry. It looks like a Sasquatch, I answered, now actually shaking, but trying to hide it. It's someone playing a joke on us, Joey said. Someone in a gorilla costume. We lapsed back into silence. The creature now walking over to where we'd been digging and started looking around. It was so large and so strong looking, I knew it had to be real. A costume could never look so genuine. And it looked almost regal. The way it carried itself, it acts like it's interested in what we're doing, Joey whispered. Maybe it's mad because we're out here in its territory, Connie said. We watched in silence. As it was close enough, we worried it might hear us. Even though we were whispering, it now got down on its knees 
and examined the rocks where we'd been digging and removing the bones, running its hands all around the indentations and then picking up some of our tools and examining them. Finally, it stood and looked directly up the hill to where we hid. I knew it could see us. It was a terrifying thing, knowing this huge creature could see us huddled down on the ground, trying to hide from it like a bunch of cowards. I hoped it would see we were young and leave us alone. I figured if it were mad at humans for disturbing its territory, it might cut us some slack, kind of like how you would a puppy that has an accident inside the house. I whispered, you can't hold youth too much. What? Connie asked. We're just kids, I replied. You're not making any sense, Joey said. I looked at my brother and sister, and I wanted to cry. They were young and being so brave, and maybe this thing would come right up here and kill us all. I wondered what everyone would think had happened, especially my parents when they found our bodies. I did my best not to cry, trying to set a good example for the others. Now the Sasquatch turned and started back toward the big rock it had been hiding behind. I sighed, hoping it was leaving and would let us be. In retrospect, kids are much more accepting of things. If I were to see something like that now, I would probably get PTSD and have to visit a shrink twice a day. But we just kind of accepted its existence, although this doesn't mean we weren't scared to death. As the creature went back behind the rock, we all breathed a sigh of relief. Hopefully, it would go away and leave us alone. But I knew we'd be spending a sleepless night in the little trailer regardless. I still held Dippy's muzzle as he watched the creature, his hackles up. But now, I could hear something that sounded like groaning. And soon, the big rock began to move. We watched as the big beast pushed that huge rock until it took its own momentum and rolled right smack into the place where our dig was, smashing our tools and stopping with a sickening, crunching sound. I wanted to yell out, Hey, why'd you do that? But I kept still. I was amazed at the strength that the creature had, and I didn't want to draw its attention to us. Why did it go and ruin our dig? Joey muttered under his breath. Now the Sasquatch turned and walked away with huge strides, soon disappearing down the canyon into the shrubs and trees. I knew it had made some kind of statement and I wasn't about to ask it for an interpretation. Its meaning seemed pretty clear. It wasn't too happy about us being there. We stayed crouched on the hill for some time until my legs got sore and I needed to stand up, which I did. I looked as far as I could see, but I saw nothing. It's gone, I said. Let's go back down. We ran for the trailer, Dippy at our heel, where we jumped inside and locked the door. I knew it would be a long night, wondering if the Sasquatch would come back, although all was quiet and the creature didn't return. Apparently, it was happy with the message that left in the form of the big rock. We felt better the next day, even though we were all sleep deprived, and we even managed to get up the courage to go examine the dig site and see how much damage had been done. It was pretty major, for the rock had rolled right smack on top of the major portion of the dig. I could see no way anyone could remove it without a backhoe. In the meantime, I wandered over to where the rock had been. It was kind of strange, but it looked like maybe it had been covering up some sort of odd-looking fossil, something stained with iron oxide. I traced around it with my finger, and it looked to be some sort of intact skeleton. I called the others over, and we stood there dumbfounded. It was about then that our parents showed up. Dippy running out to meet their truck. My mom and dad got out and walked over to the big rock, scratching their heads. You kids better have a good explanation for this one. My dad said, There must have been an earthquake, my mom replied. That rock's too big for those kids to move. 
We called my parents over to look at the fossil embedded in the matrix where the big rock had sat. Soon, the rest of the dig crew had arrived, and everyone was standing around looking at either the big rock or the fossil. One of the paleontologists got down on his knees and closely examined the bones. This looks to be a Therizinosaurus, he said reverently. We found Therizinosaur relatives here in Alberta, but never one of the feathered guys. If that's what it really is, it'll be quite a find. Now my dad took me aside and asked, What happened here, Tommy? Surely you kids have some insight into all this? I didn't think you would believe me if I told the truth, so I just shrugged my shoulders. But just then, Joey and Connie came over and motioned for me and Dad to follow them. They led us down the valley a ways, then stopped and pointed at the soft ground. There, in perfect form, was a Sasquatch track. Dad turned white. Now he got the picture. We talked about what had happened that night in the trailer over dinner. And the next day, my parents hitched up the trailer and we left. I don't know if they told the others about the Sasquatch or not, but it was our last outing with the museum. After that, we started visiting the national parks on our vacation. It turned out that the fossil was indeed a Therizinosaur, the first ever found there, and the museum eventually put it on display. And that poor Sasquatch never did get credit for the find. On to the next one. The Batut or Ujit of Vietnam is speculated to be either a lost tribe of primitive humans or an undiscovered hominid species like Bigfoot. Based on most eyewitness accounts, it appears to be the latter. The height of the creature can vary from around 5 to over 7 feet tall. Their bodies are almost completely covered in black, brown, or gray hair, except on their faces, feet, and hands. According to observers, they walk comfortably upright, much like humans. Vietnamese scholars refer to these creatures as Nugi Rung, which loosely translates to forest man. The Patoot seem to forage for most of their food, which usually includes leaves and fruit. From time to time, they also kill and eat small animals like langurs and foxes, though they prefer to eat snails and mussels for meat. In general, these creatures do not seem to bear ill will towards humans. In remote villages in Vietnam, they have been reported to wander up close to campfires and calmly sit nearby. According to eyewitness accounts, they do not speak, but like most hominoid cryptid, they do occasionally make some strange noises. They seem to know what each other is saying when seen in small groups. According to observers, they have a very dense musculature, which gives the tallest of them an imposing presence. Dang Nam Van, an anthropologist in Hanoi, collects Batut information from Vietnam's central highlands in northern parts of the country. Based on what he has uncovered, they are commonly described as extremely powerful yet elusive creatures, and their movement has both human and ape-like characteristics. The locals believe that Batut steal people's personal belongings from time to time. They have reportedly even stolen guns, although they have not shown any ability to fire them. As in most countries, areas of uninhabited wilderness are steadily decreasing in Vietnam, which means, for better or worse, that it should be harder for the creatures to remain in hiding. In the 1960s, American soldiers deployed in Lao Tian and Vietnamese jungles encountered strange, scary creatures which they had never seen or heard before. One sergeant named Thomas Jenkins was interviewed after reconnaissance mission in Vietnam. He said that in 1969, he saw a group of what looked like big apes throwing rocks at members of his platoon. This incident gave Batut their new Western name, Rock Ape. Jenkins does not believe that the creature they saw were normal apes or monkeys. Even though biologists say there are many of those in Vietnam, Instead, Jenkins insists that these beings were darker in color, walked upright, 
and were more muscular than simple monkeys. The creatures the soldiers observed would sometimes wake them up in the morning, screaming, yelling, and shaking their fists. Jenkins said it looked a lot like human behavior, and that it was obvious to everyone that they objected to the presence of the soldiers in the jungle. Unfortunately, since most of the soldiers in the 1960s did not have cameras with them, no one managed to take a photograph of these unknown hominids. In addition to American soldiers, North Vietnamese fighters also reported what they called forest people. They stated that the large creatures attacked their soldiers too. So it would seem that the so-called rock apes did not take any side in human conflict, but rather wanted all of them gone from their territory. The Bigfoot researcher Chris Brockman states that his father told him an interesting story of another American soldier who served in Vietnam. One day, the platoon of the soldier was firing on the North Vietnamese in the deep jungle. Suddenly, a mysterious humanoid creature walked through a small clearing before climbing a very steep embankment and disappearing back into the jungle. The animal apparently scaled the sharp incline easily, which impressed the American soldier. This account echoes many sightings of Bigfoot, which is also known to effortlessly traverse through rough wilderness with inhuman speed. A retired U.S. Forces helicopter pilot, Larry Wilson, allegedly had his very own encounter with the Batute in 1970. He was flying into the valley in the Vietnamese wilderness when he spotted a tree stripped of its leaves, wiggling fiercely. He then saw a strange ape man shaking the tree with astonishing power. Wilson describes the creature as having a flat skull, roughly the size of a soccer ball, and facial features similar to human. He had a clear, unobstructed view of it and was certain it was part ape and part man. Searching for Batut in Vietnam's dense jungles is close to impossible these days. There are plenty of unexploded landmines and bombs from the war that make it extremely dangerous for any person traveling on foot. The roads also tend to wash out in the rainy season, which makes them nearly impassable. Furthermore, the Vietnam jungle is so incredibly dense that you can hardly see a foot ahead, even when several people are clearing with machetes. Logistics aside, Josh Gates of Destination Truth an American paranormal reality TV series went there in an effort to find the Batute in 2012. He interviewed Dr. Tran Hong Viet, who worked at the Cryptozoic Research Center of Vietnam. This institution was initially set up by the government in order to find and study the elusive forest people. Dr. Viet has researched the case of the unknown ape beast for over 30 years and is a strong believer in its existence. He found a footprint some years ago in a very remote cave. The print was not that of any known primate, nor was it human. While in Vietnam, Josh Gate took many photographs of the fascinating print, which was shown on the Destination Truth show. After talking to Dr. Viet and learning about his findings, Gate pondered where to go in order to search for the Batut. The vast and uninviting Kabang National Park is barely explored, so he decided to take his crew there. While traversing the terrain, they were filming as they went, documenting nearly every step of their journey. During their time there, something threw a stone at them out of nowhere. Heavy footsteps were also heard rushing toward their direction before suddenly backing off. At the same time as they heard loud, animalistic calls like they had never heard before. Despite these threatening happenings, however, no rock ape made a face-to-face -face appearance with the crew while they journeyed through the jungle. The highlight of the whole search was a fresh footprint found by Gate, who carefully cast it and brought it home to the U.S. for additional study. Professor Jeff Meldrum examined Gates's cast and confirmed that it is an authentic sample of an unknown Vietnamese hominid. These fresh findings give hope to the idea that mysterious Batut will eventually be discovered. In Australia, hairy hominoid creatures are sometimes interchangeably referred to as either Yowie or a Yahoo. However, based on eyewitness accounts, 
These are actually two separate beings with their own unique characteristics. A Yahoo is described as spending more time on four legs than two. Standing upright, it is about five feet in height. It is furry on its side and back with a lighter colored fur on its belly, head, arms, and legs. Based on sightings, it resembles a thought-to-be extinct type of marsupial that resembles an ape. The Yaoi, on the other hand, is much bigger and stranger looking, and seems to walk comfortably on two legs. Like the Yeti and Bigfoot, it appears more human than the Yahoo, but more monster-like as well. Due to its high stature and incredibly dense musculature, from here on out, we will be speaking mainly about the Yowie. Yowies are much like other hominid cryptids, in that they seem most at home in a forested, mountainous area. In Australia, some of their habitats are flat, while others are hilly. As is the case with similar creatures, people who flee from an encounter with the Yowie have found that when they reach a clearing or road, the creature will stop following them. On some occasions, Yowie have been seen hunting and killing small pigs and chickens. Most of the time, however, they seem to exist on berries that they pull from branches and on the bark of certain trees in addition to other plant food they can find. Aboriginal folklore has tales of the Yowie that go back for ages, possibly many hundreds of years, if not more. According to the Sydney Morning Herald, the first Western sighting of Yowies occurred in 1795. Back then, they were simply referred to as indigenous apes. In 1876, the Australian Town and Country Journal cited Aboriginal beliefs of hairy men who lived in the woods and who were not animals, yet not quite human. In 1882, another article mentioned the eyewitness accounts of a naturalist named Henry James McCooey who claimed to have seen one of these mysterious apes near the southwestern coast of New South Wales. As is the case with most cryptids, reports of Yowie sightings were quite rare, but continued to pile up as the years went by, slowly but surely painting a clear picture of the creature's physical features and habits. In 1982, exactly 100 years after the story of James McCooey was published, another Australian man had an astonishing encounter with a strange, half-human, half-ape being. The man was walking along the coast of New South Wales when he suddenly heard cries of small birds. When he went to look at what was causing the commotion, he saw that they were darting around a strange-looking creature. The mysterious beast looked to be on its hind legs, but not fully upright, and it was looking at the birds that were circling around it. It was blinking its eyes and making a low, chattering noise. The man was at an elevation higher than the Yowie, so he was easily able to observe its general appearance. He reported that the being would be less than five feet in height if it stood upright. It was covered with long hair, which was black except for reddish patches near the breast and throat. Its eyes were small and partially hidden by some of its matted hair. The Yowie's arms were slightly longer than its legs, somewhere between a chimpanzee and a human, which is a common indicator of Bigfoot-like beings. The man was initially shocked and repulsed by the creature. Terrified, he threw a rock at the unsuspecting Yowie, which subsequently rushed off, disappearing into a ravine. As mentioned, this sighting took place in the Australian state of New South Wales. This place has turned out to be somewhat of a hotspot for Yowie encounters, especially near the more mountainous regions such as the Brindabella Range, which is a popular area for hikers. In contrast to the North American Sasquatch, the Yowie seems to be more daring when it comes to venturing near humans. While Bigfoot rarely comes anywhere near our territories, Yowies, based on eyewitness accounts, will gladly roam alongside hiking trails or empty cabins. However, that is typically where they stop. They seem to shy away from bright-lit streets, camping grounds, and other busy areas. In 1995, an Australian man named Dean Harrison formerly a Yowie skeptic, found himself suddenly turned into a believer. He initially figured the stories about the ape man to be nothing but campfire tales and jokes for the pub. He states that his skepticism abruptly ended after a series of terrifying encounters which forced him to accept what mainstream science has not, that Yowies are very much real. 
Harrison arrived at his home in Queensland late one night in 1995 with no idea that his life was about to be turned upside down. When he got out of his car, he heard a loud commotion near his back fence. It was a deep growling followed by branches being violently snapped. Harrison went to check it out before suddenly stopping dead in his tracks. In front of him was a huge, hairy, bipedal beast crashing around and pulling out small trees from their roots. Harrison still recalls the hulking creature having a mix of human and ape-like features that he had never seen before. Terrified, he ran into his house and tried to come to terms with what he had just witnessed. Moments later, the Yowie had disappeared. After the shocking event, Harrison immediately started searching everywhere he could for information about the monster he saw near his backyard. Much to his dismay, he did not find much information available. In fact, almost every mention of the ape-like being was accompanied by a mocking tone. No mainstream organization took it seriously. Not wanting to appear like a crazy person or a liar, Dean Harrison kept the encounter to himself and tried to move on. However, two years later, in 1997, Harrison would have his second meeting with a Yowie. This time, things would become much more personal. It was late at night, and Harrison was jogging in a thicket next to the suburban streets of his hometown of Ormeo, Queensland. Before heading further in, he stopped to talk to his wife on the phone. In the middle of the conversation, he suddenly heard a strange noise coming from behind him. Foliage was being parted, and something big was steadily heading his way. Dean Harrison told his wife that he thought it may be a man trying to sneak up behind him. He ended the call, turned toward the sounds, and took a defensive position, readying himself for whatever came through the bushes. To his surprise, out came a massive humanoid silhouette. The Yowie had arrived. It quickly spotted Harrison standing there and slowly and ominously crouched down behind the foliage. Harrison, consumed by the instinct to flee, made a sudden move with his foot. This provoked the Yowie, which then gave off a bestial roar before lunging forward. Immediately, Harrison got a powerful adrenaline rush and he started sprinting away as fast as he could. As he ran along a cleared path, the huge beast ran more or less parallel with him. It effortlessly maneuvered its way through the thick forest, evading logs and rock like they were nothing. Harrison quickly realized that the Yowie was trying to cut him off. Fearing his life was about to end, he abruptly changed direction and managed to buy himself just enough time to reach a well-lit road nearby. Realizing the creature was no longer chasing him, Harrison looked back. The massive beast had retreated into some bushes at the edge of the road, once again squatting down partially hidden while staring right at him. Dean Harrison recounted his impression of the terrifying creature. It was so powerful. If this thing had gotten a hold of me, I wouldn't have had time to scream. It would have snapped my neck like a toothpick. This second encounter with Australia's mysterious hulking ape man turned Harrison's life upside down. Due to the raw emotional impact, he decided he would now openly discuss and search for the creature. Later that year, he founded the Australian Yowie Research Group and started the website yowiehunters.com.au. Since then, he has made it his passion to collect evidence for and document sightings of the Yowie. As he speaks to those who have claimed to have seen the creature, Harrison asks them to sketch what they saw. He has found that most of the portraits many of which can be found on his website, are decidedly similar. Larger and more muscular than humans, covered in fur that ranges from dark chocolate to reddish brown, with a face that seems to be part man, part ape. This is another reason Harrison believes he saw the same creature they did. The vast majority of the eyewitnesses' descriptions matched each other. Though reports of sightings and close encounters continue to accumulate, Hard evidence of the Yowie's existence is still lacking. There are some interesting videos that were allegedly taken of the hulking ape man, but due to their quality, nothing can be said for certain. Additionally, there are casts from Australian creek beds that were sent to the United States for examination. Forensic experts confirmed that they are quite similar to the prints of North America's own Bigfoot, which researchers have been casting for years. As is the case, 
For other hominoid cryptids, however, these imprints alone will not sway most skeptics. Dean Harrison notes that since technology is changing at a rapid pace, the chances of getting footage of the Yowie will increase. He hopes that with the advent of high-definition dash cams and smartphones, clear footage of the massive beast will eventually emerge. Orang Pendek means short person in Indonesian. This is the name given to a small hominoid cryptid that is believed to live in the jungles of Sumatra, a large island located in western Indonesia. It is described as an ape-like being that stands three to six feet tall with a powerful humanoid physique that separates it from the rest of the local animal life. It is almost completely covered in short, brown, golden, or grayish hairs and moves around efficiently on two legs. Its name is indeed reminiscent to the well-known orangutan, which translates to person of the forest. However, according to eyewitness testimonies, the orang pendic has facial features that are more similar to those of humans rather than apes or monkeys. Orang pendic are reported to be non-aggressive in most cases. It prefers to hide away in the deepest corners of the Sumatran jungle. However, when they have come in contact with humans, they have been known to stretch their arms into the air while making guttural sound, a common tactic primates use to appear more threatening. The diet of the orang pendek is said to consist mainly of plant food like young shoot, durian fruit, and ginger root. Given the opportunity, it will also feed on insects or smaller animals like crabs. Occasionally, the stocky ape men have been observed helping themselves to a farmer's harvest. They seem to particularly enjoy corn as well as all kinds of fruit. The orang rimba, meaning people of the forest, also called suku anakdam, translates to children of the inner forest, is a group of indigenous animalist people that live throughout the dense Sumatran forest. According to them, the upright eight men have been living in the wilderness for centuries. The orang rimba elders know where most of the orang pendic territories lie and will occasionally leave behind offerings for them. They do not see the creatures as mysterious or threatening at all. To them, they are simply one of the many co-inhabitants of the forest. While the tribes of the forest are not typically afraid of the orang pendek, the everyday people of the surrounding villages have a different relationship with the hairy beast. They view them as intelligent creatures with near supernatural ability to hide from humans. This makes many villagers afraid of the orang pendek. They make sure to watch their backs whenever they are walking in what they perceive to be the short people territory. From a western perspective, the orang pendek was first heard about in the beginning of the 1900s, when Indonesia was still a Dutch colony referred to as the Dutch East Indies. In 1917, the Dutch Sumatran governor received reports of an unknown hominoid creature living in the dense forests of the island. One of the most peculiar documented cases was that of a Dutch plantation owner simply referred to as Mr. Oosting. While he was walking through the forest near Bukit Kapa Mountain in Sumatra, Oosting suddenly reported a strange creature sitting on the ground approximately 30 feet away from him. The being, he said, was about as large as a medium-sized native Indonesian, but with extremely thick, square shoulders. Also, its body was completely covered in hair with a dusty, almost grayish-black color. Oosting recites his experience with the orang pendek as follows. He obviously noticed my presence. He did not turn his head, but stood up on his feet. He seemed as tall as I am, about 1.75 meters. Then I realized that this was not a man, and I started to back away since I was not armed. The creature took several paces and then, with his long arms, grasped a small tree which seemed to almost break under his weight, before quietly springing into a tree, swinging in great leaps to the right and to the left. My main impression was, and still is, what a huge beast. It was not an orangutan. I had seen one of those apes before at the artist, the Amsterdam Zoo. It was more like a monstrously large siaming, but a siaming has long hair, and there was no doubt this one had short hair. I did not see its face, since indeed it never looked at me once. Six years later, in 1923, while surveying land in Sumatra, another Dutch settler named Van Herweyden sighted a similar creature of unknown origin. 
he reportedly saw what looked to be some kind of ape fitting on the branch of a nearby tree. It was unlike anything he had ever seen before. He described it as dark and extremely hairy, but with facial features that were neither ugly nor ape-like in appearance. Van Heerweyden noted, however, just like Oosting, that the being had very long arms, which would reach just a little above its knees if it stood up. Also, its legs seemed very short. These two factors combined made its body look decidedly non-human. Furthermore, while the settler could not make out the creature's feet, he could see its toes, which he said were quite normal-looking, meaning they looked much like ours. Van Heerweyden's detailed observations are typical of most Orang Pendek sightings. Talk about elongated arms can certainly make casual skeptics conclude that they are nothing but orangutan viewed at an obstructed angle. However, two peculiar things that seem to stick out the most are the feet and faces of these beings. They give onlookers the distinct feeling that they are not witnessing a common ape or monkey. Instead, it regularly conjures up feelings of amazement or fear that no everyday animal can. When it comes to modern orang pendek research, Debbie Martyr, a former English journalist, is the most noticeable. She spent over two decades doing wildlife conservation work and research in Sumatra, promoted and funded by Fauna and Flora International, a global non-governmental organization. During her stay in the region, Martyr interviewed hundreds of witnesses who claimed to have seen the orang pendek. One of her team members, a professional wildlife photographer named Jeremy Holden, also set up various camera traps in the area where the ape man had reportedly been spotted. Debbie Martyr and her team documented many rare animals in Sumatra, and even rediscovering a lost species of deer, the Munchak, which had not been seen since 1930. Despite their many successful ventures, however, the team never managed to get a clear photograph of the Orang Pendek, even so, Several of them claim to have personally witnessed the rare hominid at several occasions. Debbie Martyr reportedly got her first glimpse of the creature in 1990, only one year after arriving in Sumatra for the first time. She described the being as a relatively small, though immensely powerful-looking, non-human primate. She noted that it did not look like an orangutan, since its proportions did not match. The creature was built much like a boxer, she said, with immense upper body strength. It had a beautiful color and moved bipedally in an efficient manner while trying to avoid being seen by the human. Jeremy Holden did not have such a direct sighting, but caught a glance of the orang pendek while it went over a hill deep inside the Sumatran forest. He saw the being from behind as it swiftly made its way through the wilderness. Like Martyr, Holden noted that the creature moved upright, more like a human than an ape. In September of 2001, a team of three independent British explorers and cryptozoologists, Adam Davies, Andrew Sanderson, and Keith Townley, traveled to Sumatra to search for evidence of the Orang Pendek. In the three weeks that they were there, they did not see the creature themselves. However, they did find some compelling evidence near Kernichi, a Sumatran volcano surrounded by dense, lush forest. While they were scouring the area, Davies and his team spotted a set of strange footprints in the muddy ground, which they proceeded to make a cast out of. Nearby, they also found the peculiar long strands of hair that were yellowish-brown in color. Excited, the crew traveled home with their findings. They gave the footprint cast to Cambridge professor Dr. David Shivers, who compared it to other known Sumatran animals. He deduced that it was definitely some sort of ape, which seemed to have a mix of characteristics from humans and other known hominids. Dr. Chiver's final statement on the matter was as follows. From further examination, the print did not match any known primate species, and I can conclude that this points toward there being a large, unknown primate in the forest of Sumatra. The strange hairs that the three men found were sent to an expert on mammal hairs, Dr. Hans Berner, at Deakin University in Melbourne, Australia. After performing extensive DNA testing, he determined that the hairs found in the Sumatran jungle did not match any of the known local animals, nor did they belong to a human. His final statement was that the hairs seemed to belong to an unidentified type of primate. 
At the start of 2005, National Geographic provided funding for a project aimed at getting photographic evidence of the Orang Pendek. It was led by Dr. Pete Say from Dartmouth College, New Hampshire, and involved placing a number of camera traps in the region where the cryptid had been commonly sighted. Unfortunately, the project concluded in 2009 after many years of frustration due to lack of success. Today, Despite the intriguing footprint and the hair samples found in 2001, there are still no clear photographs or video footage of the mysterious Orang Pendek. However, as eyewitness accounts continue to pile up, many researchers still believe its existence can be proven in the future. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much and until next time, bye!